This morning's reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fault of foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you, you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I want you to engage in active listening now rather than passive listening. I want you to use your imaginations as we ponder again the story of Palm Sunday. I want you to see the scene, smell the smells, feel the vibes, and join in the action. And you're allowed to shout out the occasional Hosanna if you feel so moved. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, go to the village and find a donkey. Jesus, as many other people at the time, were approaching Jerusalem as pilgrims for Passover. Bethphage and Bethany were two small villages on the Mount of Olives. From the Mount, you can look down into the Kidron Valley and across to the great city of Jerusalem and the largest and nearest building is the temple built by King Herod. You will find a donkey. Jesus always walked. This is the only occasion on which Jesus used transport. And it was a very short journey. He had, after all, walked from Galilee all the way down to Bethphage. While the disciples are busy getting the donkey, the scene changes and we now imagine Matthew writing his gospel. When I think of Matthew, I always think of a very old man with a very long beard, though he might have been young when he wrote this. He writes, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus taking transport 
is an acted parable, an action with a meaning and a message. So who is arriving? See, your king comes to you. We know from chapter one of Matthew's gospel that Jesus has the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And we know from Matthew chapter one that they will call him Emmanuel, that is God with us. So the king who is arriving is God with us who will save his people from their sins. We also know from Matthew's gospel that Jesus has predicted this coming to Jerusalem. Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised. And in a parable that Jesus tells just uh, uh, perhaps the next day after his arrival, the parable of the tenants, well, it's a frightening parable because there's a man who has a vineyard and he leases it out to tenants and the, uh, the owner of the vineyard goes away and the workers in the vineyard, when, when the man sends his messengers to get the money, they beat them up. So finally he says, I'll send my son and they kill him. So here is Jesus entering Jerusalem, knowing he is going to be killed. How does he arrive? Gentle, gently. And so, riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, you can tell lots about people from the form of transport they use. Some people use public transport, trams, trains, and buses. Some people drive their own car. Some people use taxi or Uber. Some people ride bikes. But even then, there are different kinds of bikes for different kinds of people, I notice, <laughs> as I drive my bicycle. There are some bicycles for fitness fanatics. They look terrifyingly fit and I always go into the gutter when they go past. There are other bike connoisseurs whose bikes seem to have everything except a coffee machine. There are the power bikes, which I think are cheating, really. And then, the, of course, there are the eccentric derelict bikes, which others of us ride. Why a donkey? When Alexander the Great captured Jerusalem in 38, uh, 328 BC, he entered on his wonderful war horse Bucephalus. Jesus was a descendant of King David who had originally captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and made it his capital city. So how will great David's greater son arrive in the city that belongs to his family? On a donkey. There are, I'm told, 40 million donkeys in the world today, mainly used as beasts of burden in poor countries. Freya Stark, an intrepid English traveler who explored the Arabian Peninsula in the 1930s, found that a trotting donkey moved marginally faster than a wandering camel. This could be useful information if you're ever in the Arabian desert and pondering using a donkey or a camel for your transport. But the donkey speaks of gentleness. Gentle and riding on a donkey. Gentle and so riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Palm Sunday is often described as a triumphal entry. As a matter of fact, it was a humble entry, not a triumphal entry. It was not a statement of power, but of weakness. Not a statement of arrogance, but of gentleness. It was a gentle arrival. For an horrific death. Let's think about this word gentle. Earlier in the gospel, Jesus says these words, come to me all who are wearied and burdened and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the king who arrives gently issues this invitation. Come to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And indeed, in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, we usually translate the word as meek. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But actually, it's the same word, gentle. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And we learn from Paul in Galatians 5 that one of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. What an extraordinary contribution for Jesus to make to an ungentle world. And how much our world needs gentleness. We need gentle politicians. We need gentle behavior in our families. We need gentle behavior in our parliament house. We need gentleness in our relationships. Jesus' gentle entry into Jerusalem was a demonstration of these words from Philippians, who, being in very nature God, did not count equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Is humility and gentleness part of your work situation? Do you find it in your family, in your marriage? We return to the story. Again, engage your imagination. The disciples went, did as Jesus had instructed them, They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on them. I used to imagine that Jesus was a rather, uh, had a rather complicated means of transport whereby he was sitting on both a donkey and a colt, but which I think would have not been a gentle entry, but a rather uh, circus-like entry. Uh, But that's to misunderstand the way the Hebrew language works. Uh, Jesus did ride on the colt, the the young donkey. Uh, They brought the donkey's mother along so the young colt wouldn't get frightened by the crowds. There were cloaks placed on both the colt and the colt's mother. Jesus sat on one, on the back of one animal, that is the colt, and not the mother donkey as well. You'd be pleased to know that. So let your imagination just calm down at that point. (laughs) A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And we learn in John's gospel that these were palm branches. Well, (laughs) the very large crowd was because there were crowds of pilgrims from Galilee and from beyond the Holy Land, Jews who lived in Asia Minor and Egypt and North Africa, who came to Jerusalem for Passover. Josephus, a Jewish historian, claims that two million people used to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. Well, even if it was one million, it was still a lot of people. And they had to be there, you see, seven days before the Passover. So all these pilgrims are streaming into Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire. And Jesus is just one of them. And the crowd coming with him is just one of the many people who are entering Jerusalem at this time. 
You, you need to imagine scenes of Mecca or pilgrims of the Ganges to get the impression of all these people coming to Jerusalem and its surrounding townships. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And I hope you're echoing those words in your heart as I say them. I'll say them again. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Well, with all this kerfuffle, all this commotion, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the whole city there means the people who lived in Jerusalem. They don't know who Jesus is. So the crowd answer, their crowd there from Galilee, <laughs> this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. He's one of us. Then Jesus enters the temple itself. Jesus entered the temple courts, drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. I'm sure he overturned the tables gently. But this is not a weak gentleness, it's a tough gentleness. It is a gentle action because he's cleaning up the temple. He's gentle, but also the judge. But Jesus' cleansing of the temple has a deeper meaning Earlier in Matthew's gospel, he said these words, chapter 12, verse 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. What could be greater than Herod's majestic temple? The answer is Jesus himself. And by his death and by his resurrection, he will render the temple obsolete, this newly built and wonderful building. And indeed, later on in Matthew's gospel, he predicts the destruction of this temple. Do you see all these things? I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. But in the temple, he not only sorts out the money changers and those who buy and sell. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. There is the gentleness of Jesus. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were of course echoing the crowds, weren't they? They had picked up these words, Hosanna to the son of David, so they were shouting them as well. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? He, he, they asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? Well, there is the gentleness of Jesus, that he even welcomes the kind of praise that children and nursing infants utter. The German reformer Martin Luther wrote these words. The Son of God did not want to be seen and found in heaven Therefore he descended from heaven into this humility and came to us in our flesh, laid himself in the womb of his mother and into the manger and went on to the cross. This was the ladder that he placed on earth 
so that we might ascend to God on it. And at the bottom of the ladder, we find the gentleness of Jesus, the humility of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, his death on a cross. We do not have to rise to God by our own understanding, intelligence, wit, wisdom, or works. We cannot bypass the Christ who came into our world, who became one of us, who washed his disciples' feet, who humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. We cannot bypass the humility of Christ to find God. For it is in the midst of our poverty, our sin, our weakness, our waywardness, our confusion, our ignorance, our messy lives, that Christ comes with gentleness and gently draws us to himself and gently leads us to God. Though he was rich, yet he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See and hear. See your king coming to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, and hear his words of invitation. Come to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. He has come to you, now you must come to him. See and hear. See your king coming, gentle and lowly of heart, and hear his words, come to me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. It may be that you need to turn to Jesus and receive him for the first time. Don't wait to sort yourself out first. Welcome him, your gentle king, and come to him and you will find rest for your souls. Perhaps there is little gentleness in your life. See, your king comes to you gently and come to him for he is gentle and humble in heart. Perhaps you've been a Christian for a while but have been wandering away from Christ, drifting away perhaps through busyness, perhaps through indifference. See the gentleness of Jesus as he comes to you and hear his gentle words of invitation. Come to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Perhaps you've not enjoyed and received the gentleness that only Jesus can provide. And so you've been trying to find that gentleness from other people, putting pressure on them and being frustrated by them because they haven't provided the gentleness that only Jesus can provide. 
see your gentle king comes to you and says, come to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Or it may be that you are a Christian, but you have been nurturing sin in your life for a long time, hiding it in your private life. See, your king, your gentle king comes to you. Come to him. Or perhaps your life or your work or your marriage or your family is currently in a mess. Perhaps we as a church have lost our way or drifted away from God's best will for us. Perhaps St. Jude's is falling short of God's high calling to be his people, the church of Jesus Christ, the temple of his Holy Spirit. See, our gentle king comes to us. Let us hear his gentle words. Come to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My song is love unknown, my Saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Here might I stay and sing no story so divine. Never was love, dear King, never was grief like thine. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days would gladly spend.